by Sinali. Hello, Sinali. Hi, Karen. It's great to see you again. It's and lovely I'm to really see you happy too. To be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I believe you are in Sri Lanka. I am. I'm joining from Colombo. So I'm a teacher at uh, British Council Center in Colombo as well. Welcome. Welcome. And I know you have a lot of experience of teaching um, listening. And we're here to talk about teaching listening because we have a course coming up. So stay with us and we will tell you all about the course um, later in the program. So let's start, Sinali, by talking about teaching listening and what does that mean? Um, we've noticed in the past, like teachers have asked quite a lot of questions about listening and, you know, how we teach listening. So let's just start a little bit with what is teaching listening? How is it different from, say, testing or assessing listening? Yep, that's a broad and interesting question, Karen. <laughs> um, so I think what happens in a lot of our classrooms is that we um, have course books most of the time and we have a listening activity and maybe accompanied by a gap fill or a multiple choice question. And quite frequently, students are asked to simply just listen to the audio and just do the task. Um, have, have you had any experience like that, Karen? Has that happened to you? Have you seen it happen? I have. Yes, I have. And quite often, um, as, a, as, as you know, I'm learning, um, trying to learn two languages. And so I've also done exercises like that, listen to something and fill in some gaps or do a multiple choice. And then we check the answers. So I, it's, it, and I've seen it quite a lot in course books, um, in different places that I've taught. So like what what is then teaching listening for you exactly so that is more or less testing your students so they're being tested and testing is you know constantly um well trying to see whether your students already have the knowledge or the skills to be able to complete um, the activities given to them however most of the time they, uh, it turns out that they don't. <laughs> this has, uh, I've seen this frequently happen. And that's just like throwing in your, um, throwing anyone into the deep end of a swimming pool <laughs> without um, them knowing how to swim, without the skills and strategies to be able to approach these activities. So I think when it comes to teaching, listening that's what we really need to focus on what mm -hmm. are the strategies and the skills that you can give your learner or that they uh, need to be able to complete the tasks and engage with the listening activity so would that be is that what we're teaching or is that what we're talking about um like the sub skills of listening so for example would that be you know, if we think about the different types of listening we do in our lives, maybe an announcement um, or, a, or or the news or a podcast or what else might we listen to, um, for example? Is that what is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So I think um, simply giving your learners a task and expecting them to uh, complete it is difficult. It's a different language. You're just listening to some words you're not really sure what you're supposed to do exactly so, yeah that's where the sub skills come in i think mm -hmm. two of the most popular ones are learning um sorry listening for gist mm -hmm. and listening for details or specific information uh listening for gist we do to understand the whole picture or the summary of what is happening in the uh, audio or whatever we are listening to uh, for example, um, say uh, you hear the words mm, beach, mm -hmm. sunny, uh, towel, mm -hmm. waves in a clip. So you hear some content words like nouns, verbs, or adjectives. Um, what do you think that? Uh, what do you think is happening in that audio, Karen? Oh well, uh, I could be going to the seaside, perhaps. Yes. Going for a swim? Yes, so that is the summary or your whole picture of your audio. So that is what we are trying to 
um, uh, do by listening, uh, doing a listening for GIST activity. So we are trying to gather what is happening. So that's an important skill to be able to mm -hmm. pick out the keywords, figure out what's uh, going on in the whole thing. That's right. And, yeah. Well, some we've got a comment here, um, finding and listening similar finding and listening similar as both involve comprehension and receptive skills, although listening is more challenging. Why is listening why? more challenging? It is. I agree. I mean, when I listen to something in another language, my first thought is my brain shuts down going, I can't understand. I'm panicked. I don't understand. And then, you know, I can't manage to continue listening more. Um, so why is it challenging, Sinali? Yeah. So to continue on with what I was saying and to address the comment, I mm -hmm. think it's challenging because the students don't have the necessary skills to be address be able to address the task um, properly. And um, so we talked about uh, listening for gist, picking out keywords, and then uh, another activity or another skill, sub skill of listening is listening for details, where we listen for specific information in our listening activity, and we disregard the irrelevant info in it. For example, uh, it's been raining here a lot in Sri Lanka. Oh, here too. <laughs> <laughs> so if I, uh, I'm, I'm going to go listen to the weather forecast today uh, on the news, and I'm going to, I want to find out what's going to happen to Colombo in the next couple of days. But the news forecast or the weather forecast is going to be talking about all the districts in Sri Lanka. However, I want to focus on Colombo. So you'll be listening out for Colombo or that specific detail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these are, it's a, again, it's an important skill to have to be able to listen for specific things in your um, audios um, or activities. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, I think you could listen out for tone, kind of mm -hmm. tone. Interesting. Other. Are you hearing in a conversation? You could infer meaning. Mm -hmm. what kind of situation or the relationship uh, between the people who are conversing. And by doing... And, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. And I think you <laughs> can even consider predicting. Uh, it's a pre-listening skill, mm -hmm. but it can help um, with your overall listening as well. However, um, but like I mentioned, it's important to connect these mm -hmm. sub-skills to the tasks that you're doing. So, so some people might say, um, like you're talking about um, teaching skills that help us understand what we're listening to. So, some people might say, well, don't can't we already do that in our in our first language, and then we can simply transfer to English? Yes, I think that's a <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Well, let's 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 ask the teachers watching um, mm -hmm. first, and then there's a question that we've got on the screen that we'll we'll have a look at. So, teachers watching, we're talking about uh, teaching listening, uh, and for example, um, talking about gist and you know predicting what we're going to listen to to help us. And these are skills that we need to teach our students. Are these skills something we have in our first language that we can transfer to, to be able to do in English? Did we learn them in our first language? What do you think? Tell us in the comments. Um, and similarly, we've got a question here. What is the difference between hearing and listening? If a student has hearing problems, what's the best way to overcome such an issue? <clears throat> Excellent question. Um, I don't know if that's happened in, in any of your classes, um, if students have any hearing difficulties, how, how have you addressed those in your classroom? Um, I'd like to uh, address the first part of that, hearing mm -hmm. and what's the difference between hearing and listening, that's a great question. Mm. So I think listening is your active participation. Uh, the fact that a listener is responding or commenting or asking questions and is engaged with what they are hearing instead of simply um, le letting it go through one ear and out of the other. <laughs> so I think our audience are active listeners. And that's, that's what needs to happen in a listening task. So they need to be engaged with the task as well. Um, for a student who has a hearing problem, 
I I personally have not encountered such a situation as of yet, but I do believe um, students sometimes may able to lip read. So that is something I've seen some teachers try out, though I can't say I personally have. I've had some um, in the classroom and in a face-to-face -face classroom, I've sat them nearer the front and I've sometimes given them the tape script to be able to follow along, along with it or a beforehand. Um, Again, if there's a visual, that gives a lot of clues as well about context. Um, and quite often now on YouTube, you can get closed captions that sometimes will help people. I know for me, it's very helpful when I'm listening to something to be able to use the subtitles to understand a little bit <laughs> as well. Even, I mean, when I started out first learning the language, I used um, the uh, subtitles. It was yeah, Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's ve it's very helpful. It's very helpful indeed. Um, so going back to listening in the classroom, we've talked about um, doing some some pre listening activities, doing some skills work in in listening. Um, when you play an audio or a video, how many times do you play it? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> um. For me, it really depends. Uh, this is something that I am still experimenting on and I still haven't really decided how many times. But sometimes it depends on the learners. So if I have uh, assessed the learners, I have a good understanding of how well they are with their listening, then I can um, sort of decide, okay, this is how many times we need to hear this. Otherwise, uh, when I started out, I used to ask the learners. How many times would you like to listen? Would you like to listen to this again? What but, do they say? <laughs> they say yes, every time. <laughs> <laughs> so that can become a little complicated. Mm -hmm. um, other times it would depend on the task and you know the time. But I don't really think there's one right answer to that question. And it really depends on what you can do as a teacher and what um, the learner needs in your yeah. classroom. That's very true. So we've got, yes, very true. Um, I mean, I think, there, like you said, there isn't really any particular right or wrong answer to that one. So we've got another question here. Um, how about pre-teaching of related vocabulary? Is that something that's important to do um, before a listening? And how do you do that? I have definitely pre-taught vocabulary in some instances. Um, however, I think one of the questions that comes with pre-teaching vocabulary is you wonder, okay, how much time should I spend on uh, teaching vocabulary? Does it um, end up becoming a vocab lesson? Is it uh, related to listening anymore? So those can be a couple of questions. So I think to avoid that, uh, you can get, um, you can elicit from your learners or like I said, predicting. A pre-listening skill. That's a great pre-listening skill. So when you give them the task, you can get your learners to predict what kind of vocabulary they might come across. So then they won't be necessarily focusing on any vocabulary that you give them while they're listening, but they will have um, gotten a general idea of what the listening activity might be about, and it would have set the context as well. Ah yes, so you that's many that's that's a great thanks thanks Celia for the for the for the for the uh, question about pre-teaching vocabulary because sometimes I've seen course books that list the words that are going to appear, um, and so there's not really any thinking on the ha on behalf of the students, and so now you're talking about setting the context. Why is that important when we are um, about to do a listening activity? Um. I think it's important setting up a listening activity on the whole, I think is very important. The setup that leads to the listening part of it. So be, giving the students a background, giving them um, a bit of uh, time to think about uh, the words or um, what they might encounter in the listening and thinking about, um, like I said, so if, if you're focusing on a specific sub skill, then the students, uh, 
if you can allow students some time to be able to figure out, okay, this is what I'm uh, listening out for. Uh, these are some of the words that I should maybe look out for. So that that part of setting up for listening is very important without uh, sort of just straight away throwing the student <laughs> into listening and expecting them to complete a task that's in an entirely different language. Yeah, exactly. And again, I know from my experience of learning these two languages, you know, when I just suddenly started listening to the activity, I didn't know what it was about. So I was so confused. <laughs> and it really helped me understand the importance of setting the context um, for, for, the, for the students beforehand. So, so we're just now um, here with Sinali, who is um, from a British Council teacher in Colombo. We are talking about how to teach listening. Um, and we're talking to Sinali. So far, we've talked about the importance of um, teaching subskills of listening. So, for example, listening for gist or um, listening for specific information, the different types of listening that we do. And we also talked about whether you can transfer skills from your first language to your second language. Um, we have a course coming up about how to teach listening, and we'll give you more details of that very soon. Okay, so Sinali, we've been talking about all things to do with teaching listening. Um, um, and there's lots of comments coming through, although unfortunately I can't see them. Marcus has maybe realized <laughs> that already. <laughs> um, do, do we have any uh, answers for whether it's a transferable skill? Sure. Oh, yes. I, Marcus, are there any answers about whether it's a transfer, transferable skill? We've got a comment here from Dan. Hearing is a primary condition to listening and also its first phase, recognizing the language and instantly reacting. And I think that goes to your point, Sinali, as well about listening being active, because often in real life, when we listen to something, we, ha we do something. We either fill in a form or we change platform um, or we follow other people. Um, or if there's an announcement for a special offer in the supermarket, we might go and pick that up, for example. Um, so usually that's the active part around the listening. And so here we've got a question from Mohammed. There are more listening issues in young learners. Is there any a strategy to attract the learner's attention? Well, Mohammed, that's a great question. And Sinali teaches young learners, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> So, Sinali, what do you do in your young learner classes to, 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 to sort of grab their attention? Uh, well, I think the best way forward with the young learners is to make it as interactive as possible. And like I said, I, I know I keep repeating this, but I think the setup is very important, especially with young learners, so that they know what, um, what kind of task they're approaching, and if you can make it interactive and let them have some fun while they're um, doing the task, then I think uh, that's a great way to go ahead. Doing um, with yeah, well, not only younger learners, but also with 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 adults as well, is to do some actions while listening. So once, um, oof, quite a long time ago, I did. Um, it was all to do with um, routine, daily routine. And so I gave different characters to different people. And when they read the story, they had to do the actions of what the different family members did, you know, like watch TV or um, have dinner, for example, um, doing actions like that as well. That's lovely. And here's, um, yeah, so actions, I think, and a lot of teachers in the past have mentioned TPR and doing actions is quite a good way to engage um, with the younger learners. So here's another one for you, Sinali. Um, Abdul Rahman is asking, do you use L1 to let students understand some keywords in the listening task? Thanks in advance. So Abdul Rahman, <laughs> I, hope, <laughs> I hope you're still listening. Sinali, do you use L1 at all in your classes? Because you speak more than one language, don't you? Yes. Um, so sometimes I do. Again, it really depends on the context. But going back to our point about whether L1 is, um, uh, so listening skills in L1 is transferable to um, our second language, I feel like it might have a bit to do with, um, so I'm not really sure whether it is. It might have a little bit to do with syntax, uh, mm -hmm. the sentence order. 
for example my native language is singhala and the sentence order in which the words are formed is that we go with subject object verb mm-hmm. whereas in english it's subject verb object mm-hmm. order so when you are listening to more complicated sentences it might be hard to pick out okay where which part am i listening to here so i think even though it sometimes uh some of those skills like picking out keywords might be transferable it's it's a it might be a little difficult given how the um, syntax of your language that does have a big impact i know that um spanish and catalan has a different slightly different structure than english and it's useful for me to know that when i'm listening so that i know which bits go in i mean i think for using l1 in the classroom when i was trained as a teacher it was we were taught it was a terrible thing to do, that everything should be in English. Um, whereas now, I think theories and understanding of the pedagogy is changing a little bit. And so to use L1 at a key useful moment can help the learners a lot to move to the next stage, sort of scaffolding their learners a little bit. Um, Danielle is saying that um, she sometimes uses um, L1 to give instructions you know, so just to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing, which I think is quite important. And here's another question. They're coming in thick and fast. Fantastic (laughs) teachers. Well done. (laughs) It's a hot topic. (laughs) So um, this is from Ivdil. How often do you do listening tasks? This is a great question. And I have a follow up to this as well. (laughs) So Sunili, in your classes, how often do you do listening, listening tasks? I try to have a balance with all the other skills as well, speaking, reading, and um, writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I feel like, again, this can, especially if you have um, greater control over your class and the syllabuses, if so, if you feel like your learners need uh, more practice in um, listening or more practice on a specific sub-skill, I think then you can direct your attention to having a little bit more listening in your classes uh, other than the other skills, but really depends on your learner needs. And and my my question would be is how long do you do a listening for? Like you know, is it a minute or five minutes or ten minutes? Like, do you have a a a, a, a length of listening that is um, in your experience that you found works better than others? So I see a great comment. So uh, someone is saying that. Uh, sorry, let me see. Um, Valeria is saying that she uses songs. Yes. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's one of my favorite listening activities <laughs> as well. <laughs> so um, some listening activities take a little longer than others, depending mm-hmm. on whether it's a longer listening activity, you're mm-hmm. focusing on several things, uh, several sub skills at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they are shorter listening skills, then of course it will take around um, a couple of minutes to yeah. finish up. But Uh, I think it's important to remember to have a post listening as well, to have uh, your learners engage and have some feedback on the task that you did without simply moving on to um, the next activity. So what might be a post a post listening activity like in some course books I've seen, um, you know, you do a listening and then quite often the next is write a letter which then becomes a writing task with no guidance. So what in in your classes do you do as a post-listening activity, if you can give us any activities? Uh, I think you could do an activity with the transcript. I think, uh, like you mentioned, Karen, uh, there's an argument regarding giving the transcript to the students. But I think when um, when they're first Uh, starting off uh, listening, then giving them the transcript and uh, basing an activity around it, Uh, maybe um, uh, finding out which errors that they made or whether there are any differences in written and the uh, words that they just heard. Mm -hmm. Um, Or um, something like, um, uh, well, yeah. So I feel like that's that's a great way to uh, give feedback and Mm -hmm. connect back to what just kind of cement what they just listened to. Or even even doing some activity with the with the words that are in the listening or the context, for example, 
um, you know, using the same context. If you're listening to an announcement, then you could make your own announcement using the same structures, for example, you know, to do yeah. something else. Do it in a different setting. Yeah. We just had an interesting comment there on the screen about um, quite often a textbook will have comprehension questions. Do you give those to your students before or after you listen? So it's from Zaiba. We are giving a set of questions to check the listening skills of students. This is often to do with comprehension. So it's the con understanding the content rather than a specific listening skill. Is it good to give the questions beforehand or after playing the movie or audio tape? What do you mm. think, Sinali? Again, I think this can be done both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you feel like your students need to have read through the questions before, perhaps underlined some words, understood the questions beforehand, um, then I would say give it to them beforehand so that mm -hmm. they know what they're what they need to listen for. However, if they're stronger learners, then you can withhold the task and give it to them after they finish their listening activity. Well, that's an interesting point. Sometimes, um, like I've seen teachers who say to the students, how many questions do you think you can answer? And so it's the, the students that rather than saying, OK, you, you group, you answer all the questions, this group, you answer three questions, um, putting the responsibility onto the learners to say, oh, I think I can answer all of them or maybe I can only answer two. Um, and you quite often find that they can answer a lot more than they think, which gives them more confidence as well. <laughs> Definitely boosts um, learner autonomy and just gives them control over their own learning, which is great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So teachers, what, so teachers watching, we are talking about how to teach listening. And we're joined with Sinali. Um, and we've been talking quite a lot about different types of listening skills and whether we use L1 or not, the types of tasks we can use for listening. And we have a course coming up um, starting very soon called How to Teach listening as part of our Teaching Pathways um, set of courses at, here at the Teaching English British Council. So this course on how to teach listening is four weeks long and it starts on the 16th of November, which I believe is in five days time. You can still enroll in advance though if you want to and we'll post the links um, in the description of this video. The course has three modules. Um, all focusing on different aspects of um, listening. So we've got understanding listening skills and active listening and listening strategies. Throughout the course, you'll be looking at designing listening tasks and how we can get the most out of listening and to support our learners um, in all things to do with listening. So uh, you do get a certificate at the end of the course on completion of the course materials. There will also be um, a Facebook group where you can join in the discussions connected to what you have learned on the course. And I think that is about the course. So sign up, join in. Um, we will all be, the, oh, I've, I've done the course before and I have very much enjoyed it. Um, it's a free course, so you can sign up anytime and it starts in five days time. So, Sinali, any final tips for our teachers watching from your experience of teaching listening? I think um, <laughs> I think a lot of it is our times, but I think uh, the setting up and making sure that there's a task to engage um, the listeners so that they are actively listening instead of just hearing. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think that's the most important thing you can do with listening. And I think I might add one from my from my own experience of being a learner is um, having context and and um, sort of lis and listening together as well. I found very, very useful rather than listening by myself. So thank you so much, teachers, for joining us. Thank you for the questions. And we will see you again very soon. Thanks for joining us, Sinali. See you. It was great to be here. OK, bye. <laughs> bye.